Well, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us for this deep dive session on the travel industry. Um, I am going to jump right in and introduce our two guests for the day. Um, we have Oscar Munez, um, the current president and CEO of United Airlines. He was has been so since September 8th, 2015. Um, and recently, I guess nothing seems recent these days, even what's going on a week ago seems like forever. But December 5th, 2019, um, Oscar announced he was stepping down as CEO of United in May 2020 to become the chairman, uh, the chairman of United Air Holdings. So that's a uh, um, fortuitous or maybe not so much timing for um, Oscar, but um, we're happy to have, have you here, Oscar. And also, um, we have Joel Peterson. Joel is the founding partner and chairman of Peterson Partners, a Salt Lake City-based investment management firm with uh, a billion, over a billion dollars in management. He's the chairman of the board of overseers at the Hoover Institute at Stanford. And as many of you know, probably all of you, a longtime lecturer at the GSB. And for this conversation, he's importantly, he's also the chairman of JetBlue Airways. And today is Joel's last day as chairman. Um, so it's great to have you, you both here. So thanks, thanks so much. And yes, again, congratulations, Joel, on a, a long and successful tenure at, at JetBlue. All right, so I am going to just jump um, right in with questions, if um, you two don't mind. Um, so the first thing that I think is on people's minds is what, what's the current volume of demand for travel and transport? So what, what are we looking at right now? And um, has that balance shifted, the travel transport balance shifted? What's going on right now in the industry? And uh, I'll ask, I guess, Oscar, can you start us off? Uh, sure. Um, it's low. <laughs> um, and there's varying numbers between airlines, I'm sure, but they're all in that same very low category. I was talking to the head of TSA probably a week and a half ago. And so from a broad flying public in the United States perspective, he said their airports were down 96%. I, I think recently we've seen a little bit of uptick here and there, uh, but generally it's in those ranges. Um, we are seeing some advanced bookings for some holiday periods coming up. But we're also finding out that people are booking, but they're not showing up to, to planes. So there's still a lot of uncertainty. And unfortunately, I'm and we are at United are in the camp that it's going to take a while for us to get the kind of volume that we've had before back into the business. Yeah, I, I would just uh, chime in and say we're about the same. Between 90 and 95 percent of our revenue has disappeared, and we've ended up parking uh, out of our 260 planes, we've parked 170 of them and then we're right we're doing reduced routes from between our core cities so it's way way off right and, and oscar you just said you think a while so i'm, I'm curious about what your, your kind of scenario planning you all are, are doing so i'll give you a couple a couple scenarios here so let's say we have a vaccine um by the end of 2020 which by many accounts now is is optimistic but let's say we have that what what are you thinking demand might look like what are we looking at as rebound and then also if you want to add, add, add to that if we don't have a vaccine to the end of 2022 so these are two scenarios in the 2020 and the 2022 how are you thinking about rebound and demand well um i'll sort of take the question from the perspective of students who are at some point in time going to be in situations like this about in essence, planning the direction of your corporation, your department, your, your workforce. Um, the fact of the matter is nobody knows. No one. I don't care what you say, what you hear, where you hear it, nobody knows. So you have to rely on whatever history and knowledge and instinct people have to a large degree, along with some uh, the data that comes with it. Uh, we know in this industry, at least for a large global airline like United, uh, back around the turn of the century, 2002, when SARS hit, uh, which was more localized. Um, this CV-19 is infinitely more global, more insidious, but SARS took about eight months for us to recover the kind of volume we had previous to the crisis. Um, this is much larger and bigger. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I think a lot of the planning scenarios that the industry's taken is, is to shore up your liquidity, uh, bring your burn rate of cash down every single day, and, uh, and then survive, and then, and then be flexible as to how quickly you can recover with regards to if indeed the you know the kind of business that you know, with, when demand returns and so uh, I'm not overly optimistic uh, on the vaccine in 2020. Hopefully by the end of 2021, but I am 
for lack of a better term, a very founded, grounded person on the fact that without a vaccine, life as we know it, forget my industry, doesn't return to normal. It's just, it's become such a, again, an insidious aspect of our very lives that when I, we talk to people, we talk to people all over the world, um, nobody's anxious. Everybody wants to do things, but nobody's anxious to get back into the normal mode. So we have to uh, accept that to some degree, and more importantly, navigate and educate a lot of our, our customers uh, with regards to that, so that indeed, when they're ready to come back, they feel safe coming back on our aircraft. So I'll just chip in and say that, you know, we've heard all the letters used, that this could be a, a V, could be a W, it could be a, a wide W, it could be an L. And uh, Eddie Lazier there at the business school says he thinks it'll be a check mark, quick decline and long, slow uh, rise over time. But uh, you have to do a lot, like Oscar says, you have to do a lot of different scenario planning. Uh, Today I heard that uh, you know we've got a, a plan that it could be an L, which is to say rapid drop off, and then it just stays at new lower levels. Uh, it does appear though that there's a fair amount of pent up demand for travel. Now, if people can feel that it's safe, and that means the air quality, that means the the uh, the uh, passengers, it means the flight attendants uh, are well. If they can feel those kind of things, it's a little bit like like 9/11. Then I recall that right after 9-11, nobody wanted to fly. It was over. And uh, we put titanium doors on the cockpit and, uh, and uh, Oscar's right, about eight or 10 months later, you know, we were back close to uh, where we were before. So I think there, there, people do want to travel. They do want to see families. They do, uh, so I, I do think it'll come back, but it's just how fast nobody knows. Nobody can tell. And the idea of a vaccine, there may never be a vaccine. There was never a vaccine for SARS. We don't have a vaccine for the common cold, which is a coronavirus. So, you know, we don't know. I don't think anybody knows. And so on that um, note, safety, so um, the experience of travel for many people have become, um, let's say, challenging, right? The experience um, just going to the airport, dealing with the airport, and this is a whole new level of challenge. And so as you think about implementing safety procedures, there's two questions here. One, what does that look like? And two, how, do you, how does that affect the experience of, of, of traveling, going to see family, et cetera? So we, we were the first to institute wearing masks. So all passengers for the present are wearing masks. All of our flight attendants are wearing masks. Uh, we'll take uh, temperatures, we'll use biometrics. We've got to figure out ways to to uh, board faster. I mean, the TSA already slowed things down and made travel more difficult and miserable for everyone. So we've got to sort that out yet. And that's going to take some time and that'll be an industry-wide effort. But I, I think it, it, it will impact us for sure. Yeah, I, I think there's a, all of the above, there's a delicate balance between um, the, keeping you safe as our customer and passenger, um, but at the same time, not or attempting not to lose the, the gracious, warm, hospitable thing that a lot of our airlines are increasingly not only known for, but that's what's expected. Um, and, and there is, I, and I hate this term, the new normal, because we use it so often and, and I don't know what exactly it means, but I suspect that many of you in the class um, don't remember a time where you didn't have to go through TSA security. That was a 9-11 sort of instance where before it, nothing was required. Uh, and so we've gotten used to that. Uh, I suspect there will be lingering aspects of that to some degree. Um, we're working with the government now uh, on, on items that while they may not have any medical proof, they do have a perceptive proof. You'll feel safer if somebody and everybody's taking the temperature, right? We don't have any proven methods for that, but if you don't do it, someone is going to, uh, uh, someone's going to suggest that maybe you're not as safe as other people. One of the things that I urge our industry and all its, indus and all its leaders is that we can't begin to compete on safety. Um, for instance, as Joel talks about JetBlue with regard to the, the face mask, you know, United was the first to put them on flight attendants and we sort of collectively all determined that everyone should be wearing them. So all of those things will be part of uh, part and process, distancing in, in so many ways. Uh, a lot of great digital technology. Many of you are, are students in that space. Uh, the digital, you know, sort of the digital revolution and economy and all the different age that everybody talks, this is gonna accelerate that because 
uh, the innovative nature of what we're gonna have to do in order to give you warm, hospitable sort of hospitality and make sure that you feel is safe and indeed you are safe, a combination of all of those things. Um, it's gonna take a really a lot of smart people and it's Greenfield, which is kind of cool because the restrictions that we had before and certainly in a, in a older legacy company like mine, it's 100 years old, our systems are ancient, but they work really well. To fix them, to adapt them, to do different things, it's sort of like changing a tire on a moving vehicle. We never, you don't want to stop the car because you got so many customers. In this particular case, as sort of demand, whether it's the L or the check or any one of those things, I think customers will come back slowly enough that we can implement all of these incredible ideas that we're all going to have and you're going to develop for us and so on and so forth. So it's exciting in that regard, it just kind of sucks from a near term perspective with regards yeah. to impact on our employees. Yeah. So, so my, there's a, a student question, just, they're just wondering how good the um, safety procedures already are. So you made the point that there's what you actually do and then there's the perception that, that everything that is being done is being, everything that can be done is being done. So for example, the recirculation of air, is there any reason that people should be concerned about that now? Are you doing, are you looking into making changes? Um, so where are we with safety currently? Let me just say about the air, uh, I've, I've looked at that a little bit and the air quality in the airplane is terrific. And if you, particularly if you have these HEPA filters, uh, it's the best air quality in the world. So I don't think people have to worry about air quality. Um, and and uh, all the other things I think we'll get, um, you know, as Oscar says, we'll all be doing roughly the same thing to make it safe. You know, if you think about air travel, it's the safest form of travel. And it's really uh, environmentally friendly when you think of the per person cost of getting from point A to point B. So I think, um, you know, from that standpoint, I think there are a lot of reasons that people want, will feel comfortable getting back to it, but it will take time. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, the HIPAA, fil the HIPAA filters are great. Those are hospital grade. If I remember the percentage, it removes airborne particles at a rate of 99.7%. So pretty efficient in that regard. Most of our large aircraft, all our large aircraft have it, and increasingly um, we're doing, you know, so electrostatic cleaning. By June 15th, United will clean every aircraft on every turn, every time, and I suspect everyone else would do the same thing. We are going to make flying as safe as possible at the airport, on our aircraft, with our people. Um, there is a function of where it is that you're going also has to be safe. So we think of, you know, everybody will point to us and say, well, you have to make this safe and, and surely we will. But uh, I use the example publicly with, you know, Disney World or Disneyland. Um, that has to be safe. That has to be open and people have, because I don't want to go there with my children if indeed I don't think it's going to be safe. So it's a holistic process that has to sort of, we, which is what's going to make the sort of the recovery, the economic recovery, a bit difficult and probably elongated more than, uh, more than abrupt. Yeah. And so let me follow up on that and ask about um, full planes. So this is like the, the, I think, part of the business model, right? You don't want to run empty planes. So right now demand is low, but as demand comes back, are, are we, is it going to be safe to fill the planes? And as we think about that, how does your how does it affect your your model in particular, like pricing? So, what are we thinking in terms of what do you all think in terms of the potential cost of travel moving forward? Um, you want I'll, to I'll stammer through that initially, Joel, and you can follow me. Uh, we do not talk about pricing in any way, shape, or form in public forums and with each other. Sure. So that is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we can say that there will be prices, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask it in a different way. Um, do we think the, and like not pricing for anyone in particular, as we think about the broad cost of travel, when we think about um, over time, travel has come down quite a bit, the cost of travel has come down quite a bit, um, and it's democratized travel. How do we think about that going forward? Do we, do we expect that it will still be experienced in the same way, way by the public broadly? Is it, is it the sort of thing where it's not prohibitive for a family of four to go, you know, visit um, grandma, let's say, like well, well, and broadly the democratiz democratization of travel. What do we expect? How is that going to change? Is it going to change? Well, JetBlue has kind of built its business around this idea. We, we have a lot of uh, friend, what we call friends and family and vacation uh, travel. And, uh, but I think for the current time, it's going to be hard to sell middle seats. We'll probably block middle seats. 
And that removes a lot of uh, capacity on these planes. So I think you can look forward to that for a period of time. Uh, the business model that we have today probably doesn't work if you don't have middle seats. Uh, so at some time, my guess is that things will have to evolve into a, a slightly different business model. And like Oscar, we don't talk about fares. Yeah, of course. I think on the democratization aspect of that, listen, demand's going to return. And when it does, I, I think everyone will have, you know, the freedom to fly and more importantly, the choice to fly on different airlines. And of course, we hope that you'll fly uh, the friendly skies for all your travels. But that's the beautiful thing about this process. It'll be, uh, it'll be that way. Uh, this middle seat debate is an interesting one. And, and Joel sort of alludes to it. The, the economy of aircraft uh, and the expensive nature and the way fares are built and such, uh, taking out in essence in a narrow body 52 seats and keeping them empty is, would require, we just did this globally, um, uh, it, it would require about on average a 50, 50% increase in price in order to make those aircraft break even. So it, what we learn in this business is everybody always says, oh, I hate this, I'll never do this, I'll never fly you again, or oh my God, that's too bad. And then it's like, uh, until you fly someplace I want to go and it's the right price and I have to get there. And so there's this, there's this things I say and the things I do, uh, no one, no one wants a 50% increase in their average fares. And so that's the balance that we're going to have to find. Uh, there's some cool things that are out there that, that separate even coach seats from each other, these cloaks around you and all these different things, which of course add weight. But if they add safety, we'll all evolve to that. So uh, there will be things out there that we haven't even seen or thought of that will change that a little bit, but as far as your freedom to fly, there possibly, Joe, you'll agree, there may be less airlines around the world. In fact, there will be less airlines after this crisis. It is that dire and that significant across the world, but there'll be less, but there'll still be plenty and you'll still have plenty of choice. And, and how are you thinking about positioning both of your um, organizations for rebound? When you think about the okay, demand is gonna come back, there's gonna be all of these, um, I don't know, maybe restrictions or changes in how people fly. I mean, what are you, what are the considerations that you are um, um, focused on as you think about the future? How do you think about positioning yourself for a rebound? So uh, I think we feel that uh, the fastest thing to come back is going to be domestic and vacation, friends and family kinds of travel, that that'll come back faster than than anything else. We also feel like we're gonna have some opportunities to fly to Europe uh, that, wouldn't otherwise, that would otherwise be difficult to get to just because as Oscar says, there are gonna be fewer airlines, fewer people flying at these places. So JetBlue is all, we have a low cost structure. And so we feel that we're well positioned within the industry, in it, within an industry that is hammered. Uh, so it's gonna impact all of us, but we feel we feel like we're in a pretty good position relative to our cohort. Yeah, um, I won't comment on who's in what position on, on where, but I will comment on the fact that with regards to positioning uh, and branding, branding, how you handle all of this crap in the next few weeks, in the last few weeks, is gonna make a difference in people's minds and future consumer sort of attraction. And I think we're all working through that and understand that. Um, I also think it's a unique, and again, you're all graduate students in business, so I'm focusing on that regard. Um, strategically, uh, this industry, we've been around for 100 years, right? Joe, you guys have been around for 25 years or so, uh, and Southwest has been around for 30. There are things that both JetBlue and Southwest do that we as big legacy giants can't always do. And there's things that they can't as much, you know, going global and, and going to international situations. Um, the first part of branding, positioning, or anything is, and this is a bad term, but it is survival. I don't mean to overplay that and be dramatic. We've got to be around to think about branding and positioning when we come out of this. And so that's the first attempt we're all working through to make sure that we have enough cash in the bank. And so that as we cash burn all the time until demand comes in, important that we stay. And then as we begin to get comfortable with that, I mean, you know, JetBlue's flights into Europe, which were probably a little bit more difficult. There was some opposition to that and you had lots of issues and everybody was already, if you think of parking spots, all the parking was taken, Mr. JetBlue, sorry, we can't help you. Well, they ain't gonna be so taken up all of a sudden. So everybody's gonna have to fight for their space in different places. And um, it's gonna be a little bit of a interesting and wonderful strategic initiative. And 
and the strong will survive. But I think, of course, I hope across all of that, consumer outreach, consumer sentiment, customer touch points, that friendliness. JetBlue was built on all that in the recent, you know, uh, there's things that they, they do that we can't do just because we can't for a thousand different reasons. Um, but I think all of that kind of comes into play and it'll be fascinating to watch. It really will be. Great. Uh, there's a, speaking of branding, there was a, um, there's a question here from um, Benjamin Ruxin about um, the response to the incident of the, the full flight. So I assume you, you, you both are aware of what I'm talking about, that there was a, a full flight, I believe, was flew out of New York and there was a, a, a big kind of social media response to that. And I know, um, Oscar, you in particular already had, like you managed some PR challenges in the, in the past. So I'd love to hear how you, how that, how that played out for you all. How did you, did you, was that a, was it a any major event from your perspective in the industry and how, how do you respond to that? Well, of course, it's a major, uh, any, anything in the press that, that, that tarnishes or, or points at something. Uh, the media is very difficult to manage nowadays and we can lament that or we can accept that and manage it. Um, and I've, I've often been quoted as saying that they're in this industry, there is no good deed that goes unpunished. Um, we fly and have been flying medical professional from all over the country for free into New York in particular to assist with COVID response. That's what all the people on the plane were. Um, for one of the doctors to stand up and say, oh gosh, it's crowded, uh, too crowded for my taste is a, is a valid point. Um, interestingly, um, when we've gotten back to him and explained the situation and what transpired the day before and how it got so full, um, he was cool and he, you know, actually he, he went on social media and said he accepted all these things, but it did prompt us. I think one of the things that I, at least I've learned over my time and Joel, I'm sure you the same thing. Um, when crises happen, we all move to respond and we respond with the best knowledge and the best instinct and the best um, sort of objectives. It doesn't always work. So our initial soft blocking of middle seats, for instance, doesn't work when a host of medical professionals the night before say, the, I, you're cleared to go back to San Francisco, and they all show up at the airport the next morning. And it's hard to tell them, no, you can go and you can't go. That's my previous crisis, I think is the problem. Um, and, uh, and so what we've learned now is to let you know ahead of time that your flight is at a certain percentage, and we'll let you know through the app. And if you want to switch, we can switch you for no charge. Um, the fact that supports all that, we had a big wide body, a 787-10, going to San Francisco from New York, uh, four hours later, a uh, 300 plus uh, seat aircraft, it went with 40 people. We got to put the entire first lap on that. But again, nobody wants to move and change and wait. So, so, uh, so we've instituted a new policy that addresses that as much as possible. People are expecting empty and anything beyond empty is full to them. And we're going to have to manage that situation. Uh, and as Joel said earlier, with the network being brought down, there's less planes flying. And uh, we've got Memorial Weekend coming up, and there's going to be a lot of people that want to fly. And not everybody's concerned about sitting in the middle seat or sitting in the busy aircraft, as long, which is what you'll talk about, we're doing all these other things, the HEPA filters, the flight masks, all the things that are going. That's why it's important to balance those things. Sorry, long answer, Joel? The other thing that I found uh, and I learned in this industry is that things go wrong. You know, you have these things called IROPs which are weather events. And uh, then you've got crew scheduling and your crew out of JFK may live in North Carolina and you're scheduling them and then they'll time out. They'll sit on the tarmac and time out. I mean, it's the most complex uh, situation that I've ever seen operationally. And so um, what, what I found is that customers really get angry and don't understand things. They may be sitting there where it's perfectly sunny and you really can't fly out because your crew isn't there or it's, you've got an IROP in another of your cities. And so I think customers, I didn't understand it when I, before I got into the industry, it made no sense to me. But so we take a lot of hits. And JetBlue is still, in fact, just this week, I ended up doing a case on uh, when we stuck people uh, on the tarmac for uh, several hours in uh, at JFK in 2007. And you know nobody ever forgets. No, they don't. Uh, and uh, interesting, in this time and age, Brian and, and all the gang, um, so this concept of safety, the things that we're doing, uh, Joel mentioned face masks for everyone, you, you won't be shocked. There's a pretty large percentage of people that say, I ain't wearing no damn face mask and you can't make me. Mm -hmm. um, 
plain and simple. Seatbelts, we do it, we do this all the time. And so we have to make those decisions. And that puts a lot of pressure on people at the airport. It's like, what do you mean you don't want to wear this? It's like, I don't want to wear it. It's like, so now we're just saying, well then fly someone else. And why it's been good to have the entire industry line up on that is that there's no one else to fly that's gonna let you if you're not gonna wear a mask. It's like think of someone else for a change is what you want to say to someone, but that's not always the case, as you know. Right. And so and speaking of like the the broad kind of like shared um, um, concern for like the, the societal concerns. What's the re relationship between the industry and government? What should it be in this crisis? So how much should the government support the industry? How are you engaging with not just the U US government, but um, certainly um, for you, Oscar, it's a, an international or you know, organization. How do you think about engaging with governments around the world on these issues? I'll let Joel take a shot at it first and I'll come back. Well, uh, government is now our partner in a big way. They've provided $25 billion to the commercial airline industry. Most of it is to cover employee uh, salaries through the end of September. Um, and philosophically, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I was written up uh, along with Robin Hayes in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend. And uh, one of the things that I said is philosophically, I'm not big on government bailouts, but if the government is stepping in to save an industry, we have no choice but to be part of that. And I think there are some really good policy reasons for the government to be our partners in this. If the whole industry were to melt down and then the economy were to try to come back without an airline industry, it would really slow things down. And if you can imagine all the airlines going through bankruptcy at the same time, it would be a holy mess. So um, I think the government is our partner. They are in, in, in good times and bad. And uh, it's a highly regulated industry, as regulated as any that I know. Um, so they are a partner and they're, I they're echo, I would echo those sentiments and there's broader partnership and how we deal with security, TSA and who does what and where and that, and that all the thing I would add to uh, Joel's conversation is the international aspect of that. I, if I make four calls a week to ambassadors and or heads of state in all the various countries that we fly in, to see how it's going in their world and, and the politics that they're going through. You see what's going on here in the United States. Well, every other country has its own domain and its own governance and its own outlook on how things are going. Some want to open, some don't want to open. And so what, what we have to manage in a world of international travel is I mentioned the concept of parking spots. Uh, they're slots, the technical term. Um, slots are often provided to you uh, under the under a contractual negotiation that you actually use it. You can't take a parking spot and not use it. And they measure how often you use it. Well, clearly no one is using it right now. And we have waivers for those slots. But you know, if China decides to open up in a week, but the US isn't open and they start counting the clock on my slots in China, that's a bad deal. So I have to very, keep very close uh, you know, in touch with the, the senior leaders. And, and, a, and a com in a country like China with the central party makes a lot of the decisions. It's infinitely more political than business centric. And so we have to worry about the daily tweet from the White House, not a political statement, it's just a fact um, as to how, what that causes in our relationships with people around the world. So it's a fascinating world and industry, but yeah, government is very, very, very much a part of this. And there's a student question here uh, that um, follows up on that. It says, are you seeing unique alignment of stakeholder groups either in favor or against um, what what you wouldn't necessarily expect in terms of these unique circumstances. Um, so in terms of the interventions from the government, are you seeing different stakeholders responding to the way go the government is intervening? Um, I would share just a, a quick story about the whole CARES Act development. Uh, you know, people like Robin Hayes and myself and a few others well, spent, um, not sure how many days, but certainly lots of man hours uh, sort of trying to negotiate and attempting to negotiate this with everybody, both sides of the aisle, factions within the sides of the aisle. Um, and it was interesting how there are people that are more centrist and see a view and there's people on extreme left and extreme right. And, and so um, invariably you were, I was surprised by some folks that would react in a certain way, expecting them to react another. Uh, and so um, there's, no, there's no de facto groups that have been formed, but uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of people that fly a lot, uh, and I think Joel mentioned it over the time of his, how much you learn about how complex this business is. And 
you know, we should teach a class about just how airlines work. And I think people would appreciate it because it just seems so simple. It's like, why the hell can't you just use that plane or those people right there? Why can't you just have this? You know, we fly 180 million people a year at, at United. So uh, the, it's scale, it's scope, it's regulation, it's labor contracts and, and all those different things. So, um, you know, we have a lot of people aligned with all those various constituencies. So we know how they generally react but some of them cross over. If indeed they fly and, they are, and we spent a good time building relationship, another key leadership lesson uh, for students, it's like you, you have to build relationships before you need them. Uh, one of the CARES Act sort of, sort of takeaways for a lot of us was the relationships we had with people beforehand, not just in times of trouble, but in times of good. And that's when they come to support you. So, um, so that's what I would say, Joel, back to you. Yeah, no, I, I, I really think it's true. It's an amazing community. I mean, we're competitors but we do operate together. We help each other, we know each other. Um, and it's amazing how, you know, engine suppliers, uh, equipment, aircraft uh, folks help. Uh, we, we really have fundamentally the government, we've got uh, those suppliers, we've got our customers, and then we've got our crew members. And all those constituents have to knit together in a community that works together to make this really the safest uh, way of travel. And uh, so there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of cooperation, a lot of great thought. And uh, so I've been very impressed by that. I used, to, I used to, as some of the students know, I used to be in the real estate industry, which is also a capital intensive, somewhat regulated industry. But we fight like cats and dogs over there, nothing like the airline industry. So I, I was kind of, in some ways, I always tell people it was a little bit of an IQ test for me to jump from one capital intensive industry into another one. But really, this one is, is, uh, is easier to get people to work together and to collaborate. Great. Um, there's a, another question here that um, a, a, few question, a few students are interested in. Um, it says there's been a lot of news recently about refusing to issue refunds to customers or passenger flights. And they'd like to hear a little bit about how you balance competing priorities between liquidity and customer satisfaction. I think the government's requiring us to uh, refund. We, we had a travel bank giving people credit uh, for a while, and I'm not exactly sure where that is now. Oscar may know, but um, I think there are actually regulations on that that require us to, to pay back. Do you know, Oscar? Um, yeah, I think fundamentally the, the basics, and I think you said it, Brian, th there's the issue of liquidity and customer service, right? Um, that cash is in the bank that we're able to use for this daily cash burn um, versus if we gave it all back, we would go bankrupt overnight sort of thing. That's the delicate balance that uh, is hard to say, but it is what it is. Uh, and I think uh, uh, back to my concept of, you know, we, we all try to enact uh, certain policies to get certain objectives and find out they're not perfect. And so we've all evolved. And I think uh, most of the major airlines have evolved to a, uh, an increasable flexible sort of refund policy. Uh, and and that's, I think that's where we're all working. Um, the government is thinking about different things, but they also understand the nature of that fiscal liquidity versus customer service and realize that if indeed they open up those, that flood bank, then it's gonna be CARES Act 4 that has to come back and provide us even more funds. So it, it's a delicate balance. And I, I know what we do, and I'm sure we do it, we do it at JetBlue. Uh, there is instances where people clearly um, you know, have a story that they need their money back. And so we are doing those. But uh, on a holistic basis, you've seen it in the press. It hasn't been a pretty sight for us. It hasn't been because we're jerks or bad people in the industry. It's been sort of a fiscal reality that we've had to manage. Mm -hmm. And on that point, you, you already said, Oscar, that you don't, you don't know that every airline will make it through this. Um, do you expect a, a, a significant, do you, either one of you or both of you expect a significant realignment in terms of the industry, like a lot of merger and acquisition activity, um, how do you imagine that this will shake up the industry? You know, there's been a fair amount of consolidation. We have four carriers now that have 85% of the market. So Alaska and JetBlue are five or 6% players, but uh, United Southwest, um, uh, Delta, and who am I forgetting? American. <laughs> American, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> and I won't say much about America. I mean, I'm sure Oscar and I could both handicap who will survive out of this, but we're not going to do it publicly, of either of us, I don't think. I'm not anyway. 
Yeah. But you do expect major realignments. That's, that's, that's what I, I Yeah, I mean. there has been a lot of activity and I think there will be some more. I think, uh, you know, things are gonna be shaken up for sure. People are gonna have to rethink uh, the industry. We're gonna have to reimagine things. I think there'll be opportunities that come out of it. I think there'll be some belt tightening and some difficult things. But Oscar was absolutely right at the very beginning when he said, you know, the first job is to extend the runway. And that means by preserving cash which means everybody's cutting capital expenditures, cutting back on operating costs, doing everything they can to preserve cash because cash is what will be the bridge that gets you to the next uh, game. And so that's really what everybody is doing right now. Um, Great. Uh, I don't know if Oscar, you had anything that to oh, add. I sorry, I, I, I was listening to the, prof to the, le the guest lecture. I was, <laughs> I was like, there are, <laughs> no, I, I listen. It, it's uh, I think still being active. I have to I have to be concerned with things I say. Mm -hmm. um, there will be there'll certainly be assets available. Um, and I just leave it at that. Okay. And, uh, um, and that's what survival is so important. And Greenfield approach to strategic new initiatives, and uh, you will see a different change in landscape for sure. Mm -hmm. And this is a, another. There's a a, um, a founder of a. Um, of a small, I don't know, small, but a, a mobile baggage check-in um, organization. And the question is, are you considering initiatives to support such things um, like mobile check-in, mobile baggage check-in, or clear me to um, increase um, this, the sense of safety among passengers? And I guess maybe broadly, um, what kind of opportunities is this gonna create going forward for um, other supporting industries? Yeah, I think uh, we're already offering that on baggage, meaning uh, you can uh, ahead of time as you're on your way to the airport, just you know go on the on our app and your 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 uh, your baggage sticker, for lack of a better term, will will print out and you put it on your device on your uh, on your uh, luggage and you check it in yourself. Um, a touchless society uh, is going to be an option. I think we're always going to have people there because a lot of people still want touch. I think. Uh, you know, two thirds of our customers today still demand or want or require a paper boarding pass. I think increasingly on its own, on its own volition, that'll decrease, but uh, uh, providing the options where they don't have to do this, uh, you know, touch other people or exchange, I think will be really helpful. So you come in, it's already printed out, you stick it on, you put it in, you go to TSA, which will be adequately spaced, you to, you'll go to a, a respectfully socially distanced gate area, It'll be, you know, ticketless boarding, facial recognition, uh, biometrics, and a host of different things. Where in essence, until you get onto the aircraft, um, you know, you you won't have to actually interact with anyone or touch. And then, of course, we'll have sprayed and done all of those things. Uh, and that's kind of a, a picture of what the new normal will be for some time until indeed something happens that relieves people of that concern about their health. Yeah, and I would just to add to that that uh, we've actually been involved in the venture investment business for about six or seven years. As many Stanford students know, we've got there are a number of uh, them that have worked with JetBlue Ventures, but we have uh, an office in uh, Silicon Valley. And we look at a lot of these kinds of new ancillary uh, businesses efforts, and, and we provide a platform from them. We provide a bit of uh, venture capital, and we'll continue to do that even through this period of time, because we think there are a lot of answers uh, with these startups. Right. And, and, and you know, I, what I would urge, because I think that's very good advice, especially for students, um, you guys are all already at Stanford, you're already thinking about things digital anyway, by and large. But um, I think the historical, especially with big legacy companies, with large people, uh, large groups of all of, of population, you know, we call it social acceptance of technology, right? You can build the tool, um, but people won't use it. I, the, the example I always use is aircraft with, without pilots. Our technology today allows aircraft to basically be flown without a human being. And the social acceptance question, of course, is would you individually, personally, get on a flight that doesn't have humans at the thing? Some people, yeah, absolutely count me in, and a lot of people would say not at all. Um, I think this, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, A, B, things are going to change so drastically that you're going to want, I, I don't want a paper path. I'm going to use this. I'm going to try to figure out this thing called an app and, and, and work it through. And so I think you're going to see an increased demand for it. So, uh, you know, great prospects for a lot of you coming out of school there. 
Mm -hmm. And do you see opportunities for integration with other um, aspects of the travel or tourism industry? So if people want end-to-end -end travel experience, so you have the hotels, you have the airports, the transportation in between, um, what's, how are you all thinking about, about that? Um, I'll start, Joel. And okay, just, okay, sure. uh, we, we've been doing so much of this. Uh, uh, so again, you know, I'm trying to give the best example. Uh, Arnie Sorensen and I are good friends. He runs Marriott. Uh, so we've had a great sort of partnership as, as companies for a long time. And it's helpful when the two leaders are also sort of simpatico. And we, we do things like we deliver your luggage to your hotel in London. So as you know, most of us that travel there, you know, travel overnight and go to meetings right in the morning. There's always that weird, awkward stuff where I got to go somewhere, I got to get ready, and I got to take my luggage somewhere or, or keep a car for the entire day. So that's a really nice niche. And we've been well, gosh, it's probably four or five months that we were, uh, we were testing that and it was going great. So you get to the airport, you go to one of our arrival clubs, you shower and ready, you give someone your bag and that bag ends up in your hotel. And that seamless experience is something we've been working through. And of course, a lot of hotels are also working on this touchless aspect of that. Everything's on your app, your key and everything. So you walk in the lobby, you go to your room, which has again been nicely clean and you don't have to interact if, this is important, if you don't want to. I firmly believe that we always have to provide a human being to provide that warm, hospitable touch in all things. I, I don't think we progress beyond that need. There's still gonna be people that want to do that, that recognition, hey, you know, Mr. Peterson, thank you for being here again, sort of thing. Um, the app doesn't always do that for most folks. So that's gonna be another one of those balanced situations. You know, Oscar mentioned Arnie Sorensen, and I would just recommend to the students that they go on YouTube and watch his five-minute talk to the employees because uh, Marriott has had the same kind of thing happen to them that we have had happen in the airline industry. And it's really quite moving. In five minutes, you can tell how much they have a culture that really cares. Uh, more broadly, I think uh, Oscar's right that there'll be a lot of connections. Now, it happens that the hotel and the airline industry are both really hammered by this but that's going to make them highly cooperative. We, we're looking at a number of businesses that really relate to, to uh, travel, insurance, and other things that can provide a sort of a seamless experience for customers uh, that I think could emerge from this kind of thing. And you uh, mentioned, uh, Oscar, the, the kind of business travel experience. So one thing that's happening as right now we're all we're doing is having this conversation over Zoom. Um, so you might expect, and I'm wondering if you do all, if you all expect a, a structural contraction of business travel, right? So is, as will there be, again, hate to use the term, the new normal where it's, um, you know, it doesn't really make sense to fly somewhere for a two-day meeting, right, when you can do this. So do you think of shifting more towards, I mean, is that model shifting more towards leisure and preparing for that? Or do you expect um, an, the return of business travel as it was before? Um, as, it, as it was before, I think will take some time. I, I think all of us on this call have traveled, uh, traveled for business, uh, have traveled for leisure. There are just some things that are not replaceable via a technology, as wonderful as it is. You just don't experience that. Um, I think that face-to-face -face interaction will continue to be a dynamic that people want to do. Uh, from an actual proof perspective, um, a lot, a lot of my major accounts, especially uh, ones that have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, facilities and organizations abroad um, want to start moving quickly. Uh, China, Shanghai, uh, with certain very large uh, uh, digital companies in the San Francisco area in particular um, are already at this. It's like, when can I start? When can I go? I've got people I want to get through. So I think, I think business travel will be the first to start back, uh, not necessarily in the volume. I think there will be some, some slowness. I think, you know, Zuck, did this at uh, Facebook, and we had a little debate on it at one point um, about no travel through mid-2021 on no real basis. I'm not pushing travel. I'm just pushing thoughtful discussion and debate on facts before you make a determination because travel uh, and the hospitality that's on the other end, maybe at restaurants or hotels, again, back to this broad ecosystem that is our economy, you can't just look at yours and say, I'm going to protect you, employee. But in doing so, you're going to taking something out from the food chain down the end. So everyone should travel when they're perfectly comfortable and feel safe they're traveling. We make that distinction. Um, but at the same time, we do have to think about that, that you know, our whole economy is built on, on those things. And, and frankly, and all of us that have traveled, um, 
there's also a fun aspect of that. Hey, I get to go to New York for a meeting, but I'm going to see my fraternity brother or my sister or family. There's always something attached to travel that's just so wonderful over time that uh, I think that dynamic continues for some time. So, uh, I, of course, I'm biased in this regard, and it's what I love to do. I can't imagine doing this thing forever, but um, I, I don't think it changes that. Uh, I think there's some changes, but nothing drastic. John? No, I, I agree. I think we're probably pretty bullish on it recovering over time, and it will take some time. I think one of the things that we've learned from this uh, virtual world, though, is it's pretty great in a lot of ways. It can do things that I think have surprised a number of people. At the same time, I think we've all experienced its limitations and how severe they are and how we really are eager to get back together. I know that uh, I'm teaching a class this spring, and uh, while I love the students and I love what we're doing, I can't wait to see them personally. I think it, there's a fundamentally different thing that happens. I, I have a lot of friends still in the real estate industry who say they're having to renegotiate mortgages and joint ventures and things like that. And they say it is brutal. It just almost can't be done in this format. So I think there's a lot of things that people are discovering as great as it is, it really misses the mark at a serious level. So I think people will get back to it. Okay, great. And then actually on, on that, there's been, um, the slowdown has had a, a, a few, um, I wouldn't say many, but a few positive effects. One is uh, environmental, that people have, have noted that there's a, there's a reduction in the environmental impact of the way we had been living generally, not obviously not just traveling. And so I, um, I know, Joel, that JetBlue had pledged to go carbon neutral by June this year. Um, so I'd be curious to hear both of your thoughts about um, how, you how you're going to manage this kind of sustainability move going forward. Does this have any impact? And if so, what, what does that look like? Well, we've had a very aggressive ESG program, and we think that's going to continue. Um, so we're still bullish on that. We still think that'll matter to consumers and to uh, investors. And so we're going to continue on that uh, aggressively. We're not, we're not going to back off of that at all. Yeah, I, I think um, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, does it impact it negatively? I mean, they, I guess you could make a case that given r ridiculously low, historically low fuel prices, uh, that's part of the issue. But our premise at United, and uh, we are slightly behind JetBlue, and there's a large global airline, certainly one of the first to offer carbon reductions, objectives, goals, um, investments in alternative fuel. Uh, I don't know what the alternative fuel is going to be 15, 20, 30 years from now, but I know there's going to have to be one. And we made our business case on the on the on the uh, on less volatility today, as we know, fuels up and down all the time and creates havoc for and for a company. But if indeed we can find a source that's not only clean, good for the planet, and more importantly, at a stable price range that we can sort of forecast and move forward, that's kind of a, a mix of all worlds. So I can sell it to investors. I can sell it to the general public, I can sell it to my customers, and of course to our employees as well. So I think, uh, I, I, I hope nothing happens with regards to the, the renewed vigor and effort that the industry over the course of the world, and by the way, I'm in charge of this international uh, organization that specifically dealt with sustainability, and I'll continue to do that in my exec chair role. So um, I ain't gonna let it go anywhere. I think it's that important, clearly. And how do you how do you plan for something like this going forward? So I know after 9-11, there had to be, um, and, and Oscar, you pointed to this, and Joel, I'm sure the same thing with Jeff Lou, that there had to be modeling about these types of shocks to the system. This is um, quite a bit worse, I'd imagine. Um, how do you now think about planning for things like this going forward? So we run lots of scenarios. Um, we do what we call tabletop exercises for uh, the, the different kinds of threats that you have in the industry, cyber or crashes or things like that. But so I think the whole airline industry just tests everything left and right. I mean, uh, pilots are known for do, having checklists. Every time they take off, they can be 25 year pilots. They have a series of checklists. I think the whole industry is kind of oriented that way. So I, my guess is there's a lot of scenario planning going on across the whole industry. Uh, and as Oscar said before, you know, nobody knows which is the one that's going to emerge, but uh, we're all planning for uh, the worst case and hoping for the best. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, here's the, um, here's the simple facts, if nothing else. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, the 9-11 was the previous 
sort of black swan benchmark that we all sort of managed to. Um, at United, we kept around seven, six to seven billion dollars worth of liquidity. Um, and as times got better, we got more profitable and the industry was doing well, board members would ask, you know, the thoughtful financial ones like, golly, do, do we really need to keep that much cash laying around? Shouldn't we do something more? Obviously, we're, we were busy buying our shares as we had already managed all our debt. Um, but if you think of the math of, of this crisis being 3x, what 9-11 was, that would speak to 20-ish billion dollars sitting on a balance sheet. Um, everyone in the room here is financial experts to a degree that nobody keeps that kind of money laying around without a lot of repercussions from you know, activist investors and all sorts of things. So it is going to be fascinating an industry, a fascinating sort of initiative of how indeed you prepare for a crisis of this magnitude uh, without keeping so much money in the bank that you can't possibly, you know, we're all debting up to levels that we're not, it's, it, it's, it, it, this is back to the survival aspect. There's a whole lot of downstream issues that are still gonna have to be managed for some time. Great. I'm just, I'm just curious, what are, what's the, now given this, this we've had this huge shock, um, what's the biggest thing on both of your minds for the industry? What, what, um, what are you most concerned about? What do you think most about right now in this situation going forward? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'd go back to Oscar's original comment that uh, liquidity, when you're out of cash, you're out of business. So I think you have to do everything you can to uh, get more loans, uh, arrange with the government, things, defer capital expenditures, cut your operating expenses, reduce flights, do all that. Uh, but I think the second thing for me is you have to reimagine your brand. You have to reimagine what it is you're delivering to customers and think about what are these scenarios, how will they play out and prepare yourself for that. And then finally, I think you have to, you have to be uh, optimistic. You have to kind of radiate the mindset that you're going to get through this, that you're going to think of things. I think uh, communicating, uh, being transparent, um, and, and I think actually being kind. You know, you're going to have a brand that comes out and people are afraid and they will remember. They'll remember how they felt they were treated during this. So I think it, it's actually an opportunity while, while people are separated to actually bring them together. So we've, we've been very uh, conscious of our crew members how they feel and have done a lot of extra things to, to make sure that, uh, that they're well, that they're doing okay. Yeah, I think that was very well said. Um, I would only add in addition to that, that um, uh, things I worry about is if indeed this industry, which has learned, like I said before, not to compete on matters of safety, that we continue that focus. I, I think it's a really critical thing. We don't want to be selling, well, JetBlue does this and Delta does that and therefore I'm going to fly that. I just think that's a, that's a recipe for, uh, beyond that issue, it becomes, uh, it becomes a, a split world where I think we, we all suffer. And then, um, and this is back to this kind and caring issue. You as a customer's experience with us is uh, in my mind and my history and the things that I was able to do at United is indirect correlation to how the employees feel about themselves and their job. And the thing we managed at United the most is a, a very awful situation with how people felt to very much how better they felt. This kind of situation, this kind of transparency about the future, the potential for furloughs, the potential for downsizing, all of that kind of eats at that trust you know, of goodwill, that the bank of goodwill and bank of trust that you have. And I, I worry that we can do that in a way that's helpful, that they understand, and that doesn't reflect in the service they provide you. And so uh, there's so many things to worry about coming out of this, but at the end of that, we wanna be there to have those concerns, and, and that's the issue of, of, of runway, as you put it, Joel, which is this great term. Um, we have to survive this, clearly. So I'll tell a quick story about, uh, just to reinforce what Oscar said about us not wanting to compete on things like safety. Uh, after 9-11, uh, in fact, we were up in the World Trade Center towers on 9-10, I guess. We were going public on 9-11, in fact. And uh, when that hit, we only had, I think, two or three planes. So it would be easy for us to put titanium doors in. And as a fairly uh, new player in the industry, I said, well, why don't we advertise that we're the only airline with titanium doors? And everybody was aghast 
at this uh, ridiculous uh, suggestion by this new guy. And, uh, and I, I quickly understood that what a bad idea that was, but that's just, the, that's along the same uh, lines as what Oscar's saying is we've got to, we've got to lock arms in certain areas. Great. And, and then just a, a, a final question. How do you think this is, I mean, you both responded to this a bit um, in your answers there, but what's the larger role of the airline industry in society? So you all fly people around, obviously, but how do you really understand what it is that you do? And how do you think about the importance of that in the current context? Well, I think we connect people in really meaningful ways. I mean, to me, for the business, uh, it, it, it really increases the effectiveness of business uh, communications. And I think friends and family, I have lots of students that I know that have put off weddings and family get togethers and things. And I think doing that safely, you know, the number one value at JetBlue and I'm sure at United is safety, you know? And so uh, United, what did, what did you say, Oscar, 180 million people? A year. I mean, these are lives. These are human beings that have these connections. And so to me, connecting people safely in this unique way, I mean, it's still magical to think about being at 30,000 feet, going 600 miles an hour to see somebody at different places around the world. And to do that is this magical experience. And it's still magical for most of us. Yeah, I think that's well said. I, I uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the shared purpose and vision that I led in our company a few years ago is exactly that, connecting people and uniting the world. Um, it, it's that almost metaphysical to some degree. And the proof is the government carved out airlines, commercial airlines uh, for this particular CARES Act grant and set of loans for a reason, because connecting people to the things that matter most, whether it's business, whether it's personal, and then uniting the world. I, you know, interestingly, as a global airline, I have in almost unfettered access to, business, to, to governmental leaders around the world. I can reach the premier, the president, the prime minister of a particular country or nation um, almost easier than I can reach our White House. Um, it is, that's how important it is for nations and locations to be connected to the world through an airline. That's what brings commerce, it's what brings Immigration, that's what brings humanity to this thing. And it's a really deep thing and all of us fly. And, and it's, you know, um, not being able to do that, not being able to connect with people, I just can't imagine a world that's that. So uh, it's that deep seated, I think, value that we all have in this industry that keeps us going. That, that, that gate agent, that person who's telling you to do something you don't want to do or whatever, they do that job, certainly for, you know, because it's a job. But a lot of them really, really, really do appreciate the fact that uh, they're helping people connect to things that matter most to them. So, well. okay. Well, I, you know, we're about at time, and I really, really appreciate both of you um, coming on and, and talking frankly about what's going on right now. And I, for one, can't wait to be back traveling. So, I hope I hope that things recover recover soon, and that we all can uh, safely go and visit the places and people we care about. Thank you all. So, thank you both so much. Mm -hmm.